What is the big deal about Christmas? Why is it that the world stands still one day a year in the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ? Why is it that a baby born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem on the other side of the world can stop traffic today in Southern California? Well, the answer is this. Christmas is the best news you're ever going to hear. It is the greatest news. It's the best news. It's the good news. The word gospel means good news. So let's go back to the Christmas story this morning in Luke chapter 2 and see what Jesus had uh, to do in Bethlehem and all the events surrounding his birth. Luke chapter 2, let me read you the Christmas story. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his home, own hometown to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, and this is the verse I want us to focus on, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, to you. And he is Christ, the Lord. Why did God send Jesus at Christmas 2,000 years ago? Well, he says, for unto you is born a Savior. To you. It's for your benefit. The whole purpose of Christmas is for your benefit. And what I'd like to do this Christmas morning is to explain to you the four reasons God sent Jesus to earth at Christmas. They're clearly found in God's word. In the first place, Jesus came to reveal God's identity. He came to reveal God's identity. In other words, to show us what God is really like. Now, some people think God is, is some, uh, you know, harmless old grandfather. He's weak. He's doddering. He's, he's a genial enough old guy. He means well, uh, and he may be strict and stringent, but he, he doesn't have any energy anymore to do anything about it. And they think God is just some version of, uh, you know, George Burns, an old, an old man. Some people think of Jesus as an impersonal force. I call him the Star Wars God. You know, may the force be with you. But God is a person. He's not a power. He's real. He's living. And because he's a person, you can have a relationship with him. You know, some people think of God as, as the angry judge, that he's out there, you know, just waiting to catch you doing something wrong so he can spank you and get pleasure out of making life tough and difficult for you. Some people walk around thinking God is mad at them all the time, that God is angry with them all the time. God isn't mad at you. The Bible says he's mad about you. And that's why he came to earth, because he came to show us what God is really like. He came to reveal to us what God is like. There are a lot of things we can know about God, just look at, na at nature. We know that God likes uh, variety. Just look around at all the different plants and the flowers and all the different colors and the sights and the smells and the, the taste. God overdoses on variety. God loves variety. He's never made two people exactly alike. We know that God is powerful. We can see that in volcanoes. We can see it in hurricanes. We can see it in the power of asteroids. And the, the, we know that God is great, the vastness of the universe. And the Bible says that God holds the universe between his finger and his thumb. In other words, it's just so tiny compared to the greatness and the power of God. We know that God is organized. And the more science discovers about the ecosystems, we know how everything 
makes a difference. Everything matters and it all interlocks and it all fits together. And things that we don't know the purpose for, God knows there's a purpose for because God is organized. But there's some things about God we would never know if Jesus hadn't come. The Bible says God is love. We know that because God tells us through his son, God is love. And this is how much God loves us. He sent his son to die for us. The Bible tells us that we are to teach, uh, t- call God our father. Why? No, no religion has ever called God father, but Jesus says you are to call God father. You are to pray our father who art in heaven. We can have a relationship with him. We can have a relationship of love. God is caring. He's compassionate. He's close. He's competent. He's capable. These are things we know about God because Jesus came to show us what God is, is really like. You know, the reason there's so much confusion about God is because nobody's ever seen him. John 1.18 says this, No one has ever seen God, but his only Son, who himself is God, is near to the Father's heart, and he has told us about him. Jesus came to make God visible. The Bible says that when Jesus was born, he was to be given the name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God is with us. You see, God is not just around us. And God did not just create us. The Bible says God is with us. He came to be with us. And he came and he was born on earth so he could relate to humans. You know, if God had wanted to relate to birds, he would have become a bird. If he wanted to relate to cows, he would have become a cow. If God wanted to communicate to ants, he would have become an ant. But he wanted to become a human being so he could relate to us. And he came into the world just the way all of us came into the world, through a birth canal. He was born into this world. Why? Because nobody's afraid of a baby. And Jesus came into the world to save us, not to scare us. In fact, the Bible says this in John 1:14: The Word became flesh, and he lived for a while among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Now, the fact that Jesus came to live with us, it means he can understand all of our problems. He can understand all of your difficulties. One day, one of Jesus' disciples named Philip said this in John 14, 7 uh, and 8. He said, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. In other words, uh, Jesus, show us what God is really like. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Anybody who has seen me has seen the Father. So let me just say it this way. If you want to know what God is really like, take a long look at Jesus because he is the image and fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is God in human form. Now, this is the good news. You know, uh, the good news is that God came to earth in, in, in a personal way so we can relate to him in a personal way. I can't relate to a big spirit in the sky, some, uh, you know, you know, overwhelming force. As a little boy once said, I need, I need something with skin on it, Daddy, to comfort me. Not a, not a teddy bear. I, I, need a, I need a human being to give me comfort when I'm afraid. Jesus came to reveal what God is really like. Number two, the second reason we celebrate Christmas is that Jesus came to relate God's Word. He came to communicate a message, and that message is the best news you're ever going to hear. He was sent with a message in John 18, 37. Jesus says this, It was in fact for this reason that I was born, and for this reason that I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Now notice the word truth. You might circle that on your outline. I came to testify to the truth. You know, nowadays you don't know who to believe. Because out on the internet, anybody can say anything about anybody uh, with no accountability at all. And there's no, no reprise and no checks and no balances. And the, and the idea of truth checking and fact checking is really uh, uh, almost a thing of the past. Where can I go to get the truth? How do I know the truth? Not just opinion, but how do I know the truth? You go to Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you have to decide if that's true or not, because this is a a dividing line verse. When Jesus says, I am the way, he didn't say I'm one way. 
He didn't say, I point the way. He didn't say, I'm a good way. He didn't even say, I'm the best way to heaven. He said, I'm the way. I'm, the way. I'm it. Now, that forces a decision because he's either who he says he is, the Son of God, or billions of people were celebrating the life of a phony, a fraud, and a fake on Christmas Day. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the only way. He says, I am the truth. Not part of the truth, not some of the truth, not partial truth. I'm the truth. Hello, friends. Did you know that you helped to lead more than 28,000 people to Christ through Daily Hope? That's how many people have written to let us know they've given their lives to Christ as a result of the Daily Hope Bible teaching. You are making a significant difference all around the world. You know, some generous friends are offering a $100,000 matching grant. Now, what that means is that for every dollar you give up to the amount of that grant, $100,000, will be matched. Friends, your financial support enables Daily Hope to continue reaching people, not just here in the U.S., but all around the world. There is nothing more important that we can do together than make sure that everybody, everywhere, hears about Jesus and learns God's Word. God bless you. When you give a gift today, your gift will be doubled by the matching grant up to $100,000 and we'll send you the Daily Hope Prayer Journal to say thanks. And the Bible tells you the truth and God tells you the truth and Jesus is the word of truth. Now, there's a great benefit to basing your life on the truth. Jesus said it like this in John 8, 32. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. You see, freedom doesn't come from the government. Freedom doesn't come from doing whatever you want. Freedom comes from living your life on the truth. Now, the good news is that the truth makes you free. The bad news is at first it makes you miserable because we don't want to hear the truth. We like to hide the truth. We like to ignore the truth. We like to pretend the truth doesn't exist. But the Bible says when you know the truth, it will set you free. It's like turning on a flashlight. It's like turning the light on in your life. You know, recently I got a letter from a guy and he says, Rick, this last year I just feel like I've been in the fog. I feel like I've been in the dark. I was laid off. I've been out of work all year. I felt like I was bumping around in darkness. Do you know how much easier it is to walk down a dark hallway when you can see a little tiny light at the end? It's a whole lot easier. It doesn't have to be a big light, but if you can see a little light at the end of the hallway, it makes it easier to journey forward. you got to have light in your life. And Jesus says this. He says, I'm the light of the world. John 12, 46, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. No matter how dark your situation is, no matter how much it seems you're stumbling around and, and you don't know which way to turn, Jesus said, I came to turn on the light. I came to show you what God is really like, that God is with you, that God is for you, that God will help you, that God cares about you. Now, there's a third reason that Jesus came at Christmas, and it's the third reason we celebrate. Jesus came to recover God's creation. Jesus came to recover God's creation. Let me explain this. The Bible says that when God made the world, it was perfect. In the Garden of Eden, there was, there was no sorrow, no suffering, no sin, uh, no pain, no problems no pressure, no tears, no toil. The, everything was perfect. But when man sinned, when Adam chose to disobey God, sin entered the world, and now the world is broken. The Bible calls it fallen. Uh, we, we are in a fallen world where literally nothing works correctly. Have you noticed this? Your body doesn't always work correctly. The weather does not always work correctly. Your relationships don't always work correctly. The economy 
doesn't always work correctly. In fact, there's nothing perfect on this planet anymore except the Word of God. The Word of God is always true, but there's nothing perfect. Everything is broken. Relationships are broken. Dreams get broken. Bodies get broken. Plans get broken. Promises get broken. Everything uh, is harmed. Everything is, has been reduced and has been uh, hampered by sin. The Bible says Jesus came to fix that. He came to restore what was lost. He came to rebuild what was broken. He came to renew what had fallen apart. The Bible says this in Luke 19, verse 10. For Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost in the fall? Well, literally everything. Our direct relationship with God, our friendship with God, the harmony of the elements of the earth, the unity of, of this planet, all of the things that were intended to be perfect are no longer perfect. It was all lost because man threw it away by dis disobeying God. Now, the Bible says that we're all lost, but Jesus came to find us. He said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. You see, God sent Jesus on a rescue mission. In, in Matthew 20, 28, it says this, I did not come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And I want to tell you that if you don't have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ yet, you're lost. You're lost without Christ. And you need a personal Savior. Believe me, if you didn't need a Savior, Jesus wouldn't have spent all the time and worst wasted the effort to come to earth to save you. I don't know if you've noticed that today there are a lot of saviors out there. There are political saviors. There are commercial saviors. There are, you know, military saviors. There are medical saviors. They're all promising to save your life. And every politician comes along and, you know, acts like they're going to be the next Messiah. And every medical uh, company comes along and acts like this next pill is going to save your life and on and on and on. But there's only one real savior, and that's Jesus Christ because he can only save you from yourself, save you from your sin, save you from a life without meaning, save you from an eternity without God. I read this poem once, I want to read it to you. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. And if our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a savior. Now let me just be real candid and frank with you. This last year and in previous years, you've done some things that you feel bad about. You know it and if you even just thought about it for a minute, they start coming up the top. You go, I wish that had never happened. We all have regrets and we all have shame and we all have guilt in our lives. There is no reason for you to carry that garbage into the next year. Don't take it into 2011. Let it go. Jesus came at Christmas and grew up and died on the cross and rose again so that you don't have to carry your guilt into next year. You can let it go. You can receive his forgiveness. The point is, if we hadn't needed this Savior, God wouldn't have sent one for us. So quit trying to save yourself. Finally, number four, the fourth reason we celebrate Christmas is that Jesus came to reproduce God's life in you. Jesus came to reproduce God's life in you. You say, I don't understand it. Well, let me explain it to you. Jesus said it like this in John 10:10. 10, 10. He said, I have come that you might have life and that you will have it to the fullest. You know, Jesus used this word life over and over. He said, I am the life. I come to bring you life. I give you life. The word life is used over 200 times in the New Testament. What does he mean by an abundant life? He said, I've come that you might have an abundant life, a full life. Well, it's a life of purpose, it's a life of peace, and it's a life of power. That's the kind of life God offers to you. 
And he says, the more you turn to me, the more I can pull that out of your life. Now, the abundant life is not just for here and now. It go, goes on and on forever. It's an eternal life. It just doesn't end at death. It goes on and on and on. And that's why Jesus Christ at Christmas time is such great news. Our past forgiven, our purpose for living, and a home in heaven. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, no mere man has ever seen or heard or even imagined the wonderful things God has ready for those who love the Lord. He says, you can't even imagine what heaven's going to be like. No wonder it's good news. No wonder we celebrate it. No wonder the world shuts down at Christmas. Because this is the best news. Without this, life has no meaning, no purpose. It is motion without meaning. It is petty. It is pointless. Christmas is the good news. This is God's gift to you. You know, the word we hear most often at Christmas time is that word, gift. And we talk about what are you getting for Christmas? What are you giving for Christmas? You probably already opened your gifts at Christmas. People frantically searching for the right gifts. Kids frantically asking for the right gifts, guessing what's under the tree. Do you know where that gift giving tradition started? It started with God. God gave us the first gift at Christmas. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I don't want you to overlook him this Christmas. I don't want you to miss Christmas. I want you to get to know this one who came to be your savior. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Maybe you've never been in church or maybe you've gone to church every Christmas of your life. But I want to invite you to pray this prayer in your heart right now. Dear God, I don't understand it all, but I thank you for sending Jesus at Christmas. Just pray that in your heart. Dear God, I don't understand it all, but I thank you for sending Jesus at Christmas. Thank you that he came to show me the way. Thank you that he came to give me life. Thank you that he came to forgive my sins. Thank you that he came to show me what you're really like. Thank you that he came to restore that which was broken in my body and my life and my relationships. Thank you that he wants me to be with him forever. Dear Jesus Christ, I want to know you. I want to learn to love you and trust you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I don't understand it all, but I want to follow you. I want to turn from my way to your way. And I ask you to fill my life with your love and your presence that I may have not just a new life, but an abundant life and eternal life. Today, I say yes to you, Jesus Christ. I receive your Christmas gift. In your name I pray, amen. Hi, everybody. Merry Christmas. Can you imagine standing in a dark field one night, and suddenly somebody flips on a bright searchlight. That instant change from darkness to light would be so disoriented, and you probably would instinctively cover your eyes to adjust the brightness. It would just be too bright. You know, something similar happened to the shepherds on that first Christmas night. When the Bible says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. That's in Luke chapter 2. And the Bible says that when that bright light shined in that dark field, the shepherds were terrified. But you know what? They didn't need to be afraid because the angel's message was one that Jesus said, the one who is the true light who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. That's John chapter 1, verse 9. His light shines in the darkness, 
And the Bible says the darkness can never extinguish it. This Christmas, Jesus came to exchange your darkness and the dark days that you may be going through right now for his light. Friends, this is what Christmas is all about. Jesus came to light up your life in the middle of darkness. I don't know what darkness you're going through, but God does, and I know the answer. You know, Jesus says, you are like light for the whole world, and your light must shine before God so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus said that, and you're doing that in your support of daily hope. As a faithful partner, you are sharing the light of Jesus literally every day with people all around the world who are in darkness. And this Christmas, I am so grateful for you. Thank you for going on mission with me. We couldn't do it without you. This is a, this is a partnership. You know I don't take any money. for this ministry. We're doing this together for the global glory of God. And my prayer for you is that the light of Jesus will shine through you and draw those around you to Christ this Christmas. I just want to say to you as we end this year on behalf of the entire Daily Hope team and we pray for you, may you have a blessed and wonder-filled Christmas, full of light from the source of all light, Jesus. Merry Christmas, everybody.